Carl Murphy, thank you for joining me on GV Talks. How's it going? Thanks for having me. My pleasure, man. Happy birthday for the other day. Thank you. How old did you turn? Uh, I turned 22 and I had celebrations on the same day as the Hottest 100, so it was a good day. Do you feel like you have all the time in the world? At the moment, like, yes, I'm doing a gap year from uni at the moment and I've been back since March last year and um, I'm back here until August, so I've got a lot of time just to sort of have time to myself and explore different things so yeah yeah it does feel a bit that way are you scared about getting older yes and no like there's there's definitely a lot of pressures that come with that but it's also something that's like extremely exciting yeah um like it's daunting the fact that there are so many different things you could be doing and you can never do all of them but it's also sort of an exciting thing that you know you can just sort of write your own story just kind of go wherever yeah. life takes you. There's always a sense that you're missing out no matter what path you take. And there's definitely a, a coming together of the person who you could be and the person that you've decided to become and finding a peace between them. Because like you said, you can't do every single path. But I feel like I didn't really come to that realisation to much older than 22. So it's pretty cool that you've uh, already realised that. Yeah, I think that's something I've had to kind of grapple with um, at uni. So um, I've been doing university over in um, America um, and in the sort of environment they have on campus there, it's very like everyone's doing something crazy and something awesome and there are so many different you know student organisations and clubs and activities and things to do and different careers to pursue. And it's like, I want to try this, I want to try that. Like, and you're just trying to like get involved in everything. But... Yeah. You really can't, and um, I think that's what a lot of people have found throughout their first year. They just take on too much, and they just completely burn out. Um, that's something that I've had to learn while I was over there was sort of managing your time and actually, you know, being a bit wiser about what you choose to pursue. Yeah, great. We'll get more into that in a sec, but before we get too deep into it, do you want to let the Shepherd and locals know who they're listening to? Yeah, so uh, my name's Kyle Murphy. Um, Born and raised in Shepparton. Um, I've done uh, track and field as my sport um, throughout high school and that's taken me over to the United States um, where I'm now studying and competing for Harvard University in Boston. Um, I've completed two years there and I'm now back on a gap year during the pandemic and I plan to go back to complete another two years um, toward the end of the year. Yeah, it's crazy. Would you identify yourself as an athlete? That's the thing, like, like yes and no. Like, when I'm in that environment, yes. Like, you, you're really surrounded by people who love athletics and their life is, is that sport. And then when I'm at home, it's, it's much different because when I'm training um, and playing in competitions and that sort of thing, like, there's not a lot of structure around it. Like, yeah. there's not a lot of other people you kind of do much with track and field um, and it's very easy to start feeling a bit isolated from that world of athletics yeah. um, and then especially then like your attention starts being drawn toward different aspects and of life and yeah just trying to like form a, a consistent sense of identity when it comes to you know academics or sports or photography or whatever it is I might be doing yeah yeah those three things you just mentioned can you juggle much more than that i would love to as we sort of touched on earlier like there's so many things i'd love to really sink my teeth into but i also find myself to be a pretty competitive person and i can't stand the idea of trying something and not being able to commit as much as i can to it yeah so if i took on too much then it's like you're kind of half-assing everything that you're doing yes rather than being able to really commit to a few things do you want to tell us how your um, track and field career began yeah it was a bit of an interesting one um i sort of just did athletics all throughout the school sports days and whatnot um in high school um and each year that would sort of take us up to state championships and that sort of thing um and i'd win those like a few years here and there and then i believe in year nine I qualified for the national championships 
um, after those state competitions. And we're like, oh, well, maybe that's something we should have a go at. And um, so we're like, oh, well, we might need to join a club uh, to actually do the national championships. Um, and I came across a coach from Bendigo while I was at the States. Mm. Um, and I ended up beating the field and coming first. And he was kind of just a bit shocked that like, who's this kid who's not actually in a club or anything? Um, and he's sort of clearing the field and trying to go to nationals. And he was like, hey, like if you wanna come over to Bendigo, do a bit of training with us, like we'd be more than happy to have you. Um, so I gave that a go um, and pretty much went to nationals, went really well. Um, and I was just stuck with it because I was having fun. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Did you learn the initial skill through a school? Yeah, like... Like I mean, at your high school? like Yeah, well, the first time I jump? did triple jump was probably in primary school. Like, we just learned it during PE classes yeah. or whatever. Um, and, yeah, it just kept going really well. And, like, sometimes my dad and I would practice in the backyard or something, set out some cones and, like, you know, just leading up to regionals or states and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so it was mostly self-taught up until that point when I went to nationals and joined a club and then I got some, you know, proper instruction in it and things just kept moving up from there. What sort of instruction did he give you? Um, a lot of very, looking back, very simple, very fundamental things, but they make a world of difference, especially in something like triple jump. Um, for example, like when I used to triple jump, I'd be very much on my toes on yeah. every contact and that's just asking for shin splints. Um, and I did have shin splints pretty bad. Um, so something as simple as dorsiflexion of the ankle and like landing properly with more flat contact um, just made a massive difference. But it's something that's so hard to like um, rewire, you know. Yeah. And what Do you know what your stats are in terms of like how tall you are and how much you weigh and all that sort of stuff? Um, I believe I'm six foot three in height. Um, I think in centimetres that's like 189 or something yeah um, and I weigh about 75 kilograms and the people who are at the highest level for your sport do you know what the average stats are for those guys probably about similar I believe like you, you get a few different body types but um, a few of the recent high performers like you're looking at um, Christian Taylor and um, Picardo and um, those types of jumpers um, they're very kind of got lean builds yeah um and they're probably about my height um but then historically you also have some more stocky um athletes that are more like just strength and power based as well so you get a few varieties what age do people usually hit their prime for track sports um it depends on the event but from what i've seen with the jumpers um tends to be sort of mid to late 20s um where they're really consistently hitting good performances. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a loose idea of what your goal in the sport is? It's a tricky one um, because it's something that's evolving and changing all the time. Um, So like when I was in high school, my goal was one, to go to an NCAA college in America and two, was trying to make the World Under 20 Championships um, and at that point you know I hit the first goal and the second goal I came very close to but I narrowly missed out um, and then so the new goal has then to be like make it to NCAA national championships for example um, and I was about to enter my second season um, last year in the States and it was in really good shape and looking forward to trying to hit those qualifiers um, but sort of COVID took those seasons away so yeah. still, still waiting to actually show what I've got um, in America. Um, but then looking beyond um, college is where things start to get a bit hazy because, like, I love athletics to bits. Um, and it's something I always see myself being involved with. Um, but there are many other things in my life that I also am really passionate about. Um, and the higher you tend to go in a sport, the more it requires your time to remain competitive. Yes. Um, so what I'm sort of tossing up with at the moment is, 
you know, do I aim for something like world championships and Olympics, etc., cetera, um, which would require close to 100% of my time um, to really be competitive for that? Or, you know, if I do that, am I sacrificing, um, you know, other aspects of my life? 100%. Like, and the question you're asking is, would you prefer to have 80% over five different pillars yeah. or 100% in just one pillar? And I think if you reflected on your life at the end, a more balanced life would probably be a safer bet on overall happiness. Yeah. Because if you gave 100% of your weight, 100% of your life away to this track exercise, like every other aspect's going to, like not crumble, but like it's going to fall behind. Yeah, exactly. And at such, at, at that high level of competition like you said it's, even if you are one of the best in the world it's still you have to be the best of the best in the world mm. so scary man yeah and, and that's what's tough is because I I can't see myself um, being like a part time athlete I see myself I'm either all in or I'm not trying to compete because I, if I'm going to compete I want to be attempting to make it to the top yeah you know do you feel pulled to one of the other more right now no so it's, this is sort of where i'm using this time away from school um this gap year that i'm on is really just allowed me to sort of take a step back from everything really reassess things and hopefully when i head back i'll go back with um more intent more purpose do you feel like like can you speak on how you feel having COVID taken away one of your seasons? I mean, it's really tough, but everyone's in the same boat. Um, athletes all over the world, even the the, the best in the world, um, you know, have been messed around with Olympics and whether that's even going forward. Um, so I can't look at it um, as if it's like, something that's just affecting me because it's not it's literally happened to everyone and it is extremely inconvenient but like you know the silver lining is that it's more time um to just be training and preparing for when we do come back so i can just you know for example in the long jump um historically i've always done the hang technique which is sort of when you take off in the air you just sort of um hanging almost sort of sailing I guess yeah. right um, and a hitch kick which is where you're more like running in the air is something that I've wanted to try um, but you never have time when you're training um, pre-season and during season you're too focused on other things so this time off has allowed me to actually like give that a better crack um, and sort of restructure some fundamentals in my jumping which I think in the long term will be beneficial to me, yeah. but just didn't have time in the short term to do that. So, yeah, this time off, you know, it, you can look at it as being a positive thing. Yeah. I, I understand. But I just feel like the, the clock is ticking and they've taken a year of your competition away from you while you're in that period that is your prime, it just would break my heart. I know what you're saying, but it would just kill me, I reckon. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So with your um, with your track sports, has it taken much away from like your teenage years in terms of like commitment? Like have you missed out on parties? Like what have you given up to be where you are right now? So I think... It depends on how you manage your time. Um, so I, I would say no. I think I've had a very, you know, a good sort of social life throughout my teenage years as well, as well as in college. And it's all about, you know, responsibly handling your commitments. And um, I, I think, if anything, just being able to work really hard and having other people around you that are also working really hard means that... that little bit of time that you guys get off together is really valuable yeah. and you can really enjoy it a lot more and especially um, at school when you're surrounded by people who are doing the same thing it really becomes um, a lot more manageable yeah. um, 
because you know you're seeing your teammates every single day with training um, and then you guys finally get some free time of your own and you're like you know yeah you cherish it a lot more yeah yeah definitely would you say your circle is full of other track athletes there wouldn't be that many in Australia like in Shepparton in particular no um like there, there is a circle of track athletes that um, I'm definitely good friends with. Um, they're generally outside of Shepparton. Yeah. Um, so there's quite a few boys like in Melbourne and in Geelong and other parts of the region. Um, and particularly when we were all still in Australia in high school, it was really fun to like every single year we'd all show up to States together and kind of meet again or we'd all see each other at the Nationals. And um, there's sort of that fun group of guys that you know you see very rarely but um you know you're all very close because you share that sort of connection through the sport where do you reckon your competitive side comes from that's interesting i don't really know i mean i've always grown up i've i've been a gamer pretty much all my life and i've always grown up trying to you know do games and stuff with my friends and always just trying to win um so I don't know, it could stem from something like that. But I don't know, I, I just enjoy, like, I don't care so much about, um, like, winning or losing. I just like the idea of really pushing to be better. Um, throughout most of my track and field career, like, I was second in Australia. Yes. Um, and I actually preferred that over being first because that meant there was someone to chase, someone to keep me motivated. Um, and yeah so I, I just like the, the feeling of sort of chasing personal bests and improvement and that sort of thing do you remember how you felt when you missed out on the under 20 worlds it was extremely bittersweet um, because that was the one year that I finally did win the national championships um, in the triple jump um, but I still didn't hit the qualifying mark to make the Australian team um, which is bizarre. They tend to prefer to take no one yeah. than someone that's slightly under their standard. Um, oh, that's rough. Yeah. No, athletics in Australia is interesting, uh, to say the least. But there, there's a lot of um, junior athletes who are transitioning to the open ages um, who tend to go over to America because it's kind of a good um, bridging system for just transitioning into high-level athletics. Yeah. Um, because it's really tough here. There's not a lot of um, support structure in it unless yeah. you're the top of the top, like already looking at um, sort of world level standards. It wouldn't be, it doesn't seem celebrated like it is in America, track sports here in Australia. Mm, I think, especially in Europe as well, it has a really good foothold. Um, but yeah, it's one of those sports that just, um, it, its community consists of the people who kind of are directly involved with it. Um, I find like so all the athletes and coaches and um, all the officials and everyone that goes into that um, in terms of spectators it's not a big spectator sport which is unfortunate here Um, and I'd love to see it sort of grow and find more appreciation Um, yeah it's something that's got to happen over time and we had um, an event called Nitro Athletics in Melbourne a few years ago yeah and that was unreal so that that was sort of a, a different format to the usual athletics meet. And um, sort of Usain Bolt came into that event and brought the, the Bolt All-Stars. And then you had like a, an Australian team and like a Japanese team, Chinese team and all this sort of thing. And Lakeside Stadium in Melbourne was packed out, you know. Wow. Um, and yeah, so I would love to see sort of more stuff like that really start getting athletics back on the map. Did you compete in that? No, I was a spectator. Uh, so these these were like elite guys, and I was probably seventeen at the time. I was nowhere near. Yeah. What's the difference between first and second place? Like when when you're competing in the national championships, you said you came second a lot. Yeah. What was the difference? Oh, uh, it's usually a matter of, um, you know, about thirty centimeters or so. Um, that seems like a lot. Yeah, because well, that guy in particular that I was chasing was extremely good. Um, between second and third, it was usually like a matter of centimetres, like you know, two or three centimetres. Um, and this other guy was definitely just like 
um, another level up. So he, it, it always seemed like he was like a year's training worth like ahead of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was he, um, was he physically or mentally different in any way? He was, he was tall as hell. He was very lanky, long legs. Yeah. Um, no, he was just, um, yeah, very tall, very strong. Um, yeah, just physically very well developed. What stage is he at at the moment? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't seen him competing recently. Okay. Um, I need to check in on that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any um, really bad injuries? Yeah, I've had two that come to mind. Um, I did my right ankle um, a few years ago and I injured the posterior tibial tendon, I believe it is. So it's it wasn't like a rolling injury like you would have in basketball or soccer or something like that. It was more of a direct impact from doing a hop in a triple jump. Um, and so it was like a bit more internal, this this tendon. Um, and that made it a really tough injury to recover from because I could tape up my ankle as much as I wanted, but it didn't help Yeah, because rolling wasn't the problem. And it would feel absolutely fine every time I would go to run and I'd be like, oh, well, like maybe it's getting better. And then I'd go to do another triple jump and just, you know, hurt it again. Um, so that took a few months of like very slowly easing back into it. Um, but that's come good since then. And the other major injury I had was about two years ago now, I broke um, the scaphoid in the wrist. Um, that was in the gym doing a hand clean. Really? Yeah. Not in my gym, I hope. No. This, this, <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this was in America um, yeah. at the strength facility there. And I just hadn't chalked up enough on my last rep and sort of slipped out of one hand and just sort of caught the other on the way down. Did you have anyone believe you couldn't make it because you're from Shepparton? Um, well, when I first mentioned the idea of um, going to America for athletics and academics and stuff, I mentioned it to mum. She kind of laughed. She's like, ah, that, that'd be funny. Sort of thing. Yeah, well, it, um, it's, it's such a cool thing that's happened and I want to get into that next but like you just don't hear about people getting scholarships from or I don't know anyone else yeah who's it, got a scholarship to somewhere like Harvard yeah well, we, we've got um, Carter Swift um, went to school with me at Wanganui he was a year level above me and he went to Michigan yeah wow um, for an NCAA scholarship and he's now in um, Arizona at Arizona State um, so that's the Main other one I know of who's done that. Did he um, plant the idea in your head? Partially, yes. Um, so I kind of looked at what he did and then I also went to this event in Melbourne, um, which was about, it was like a recruiting agency um, that pretty much said like, um, hey, we can get you into an NCAA school in America. Um, you pay us X amount for this package and we'll handle, you know, contacting of coaches and we'll make a video for you and we'll do all these things for you and I thought oh that's a great idea I'll, I'll go do it myself though because I don't want to pay that yeah, well, yeah. massive amount of money um, didn't really feel like we could actually afford that either so that's why I kind of took the idea and ran with it but decided to do it myself um, and so it was a matter of just kind of learning the process and how to actually be eligible to apply to colleges can you summarize it? For, let's say there was a kid listening who was in his sport in Shepparton. Like, how yeah. would he go about it? Yeah, so basically the, the best way to go like, um, is just start finding NCAA teams on the internet. So just Google, um, you know, for example, UCLA in California. UCLA track and field roster. And in there you might find the coach's contact, his email. And you just sort of write like a bit of a introductory email hi my name's Kyle um, I do this sport these are my performances um, I hope to talk to you about potentially joining your team um, 90% of the emails you send out will get no response 
um, but you only need a few to actually come back with interest and they will help you through the process, which is, um, so you've got to sit the SAT, which is like a standardized test um, for like reading, writing and math. Um, you need to get your um, academics converted to a GPA, which is like a score out of four. For example, like four is an A, three is a B sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and then you need to just go through the NCAA eligibility center and tick off all these boxes of, you know, making sure you haven't been competing professionally or anything like that because you have to be classed as an amateur to be allowed to go. And then moving forward, you get a scholarship to Harvard. You did. Yeah. And do you have to pay anything? So we've ended up very fortunate with our position in that um, we we're on need based financial aid um, at Harvard compared to like most other schools. It's athletic scholarship. Yeah. So the difference with this is that in theory, I could stop my sport and still have my scholarship, yeah. which is like a, a, a nice relief. Like I have no intention to do that, but it's nice to know that like um, there's always that to fall back on. Um, and so for our situation, um, we are on a full scholarship and it's ended up um, more cost effective for my family for me to be over there than it would have been to study locally. Wow. So you don't need to like hit certain numbers to keep your scholarship? or No. So that that's why having that pressure taken away is so nice because I can really just focus on, you know, performing to my best, like, you know, my own way rather than having this financial pressure placed on my family. Yeah. Um, and it definitely also, I feel, takes some of the pressure away on, like, if, if it was a large burden on my family, um, there'll be a lot more pressure to do particular things with it. Yes. Um, yeah, so I feel like this way has given us a lot of freedom and um, chance to just explore things. How would you explain the coaching for Triple Jump over there compared to the coaching here? Mm. So it's it's definitely a very different environment because the coach is handling a lot of athletes. So our squad is of about 20 guys of the sprinters, hurdlers and jumpers. And so he's helping manage all of them in each session. Um, but we do have days where we're doing like just jumping, for example, and he will give us lots of specialised attention, which is great. Um, and I found the the coaching has been really, really quality, very good. Um, but at the same time, like the coaching here, um, if I were to find a coach here, it would generally be like someone who only does triple jump or only does long jump and is very, very specialised. Yes. Um, which is amazing. Um, the only issue there is that, you know, I live in Shepparton and they're mostly from Melbourne and that sort of thing. Yeah. And so I have gone and um, done a few sessions with coaches in Melbourne. Uh, like I, I went to Essendon a few times in the last few months um, with a squad that's full of jumpers. Um, that was really nice just to just get back in the environment of high-performing triple jumpers and whatnot. Yeah. And um, really just kind of get motivated with it all again. Um, but yeah, and then back in Shep, it's mostly just sort of my dad and I sort of doing our own thing. How many hours do you dedicate to training at the moment per week? At the moment, I've backed off a little bit and I'm mostly like sort of maintaining my form and fitness. Um, so I may be doing sort of three or four days a week, um, whether it be at you know your gym or just a session at home or at the track. Yeah. Um, whereas when I'm at school, it's sort of six days a week for nine sessions. So it'll be six days track training plus three days of gym. Do you feel run down after that? That seems like quite an intense schedule. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's that's where the um, time and personal management skills really come into it. So, like, the way our day sort of looks over there will be, like, classes are running from, like, 9 a.m. to 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, then we'll have, like, a bit of a power nap, like a 20-minute power nap, then go straight to training. Training will then run till about 6.30 and then it's homework until midnight, pretty much. And then you just sort of go to sleep, do it again. Um, and so over the last two years, I definitely was feeling that burnout. 
and so yeah this time off has been really good to sort of regroup and refocus yeah does it follow like a strict diet or anything no so we get some education on um, our dietary needs and suggestions and learning just what foods will give us that Um, but that's all up to us like we go to the dining halls and we're sort of self-sufficient in choosing what we need yeah um and generally i find that the athletes you know in theory they could just eat crap and just not treat their body properly but just the demands of their day-to-day schedule sort of require them to eat well and if they don't they're going to struggle so i think by necessity we tend to eat fairly well um but at the same time, because we're exercising quite a lot, like we can also afford to, you know, like have a bit of pizza or ice cream here and there. Yeah. You know, it's not extremely strict like that. Yeah, hundred percent. Like you, you hear stories about like Michael Phelps eating ten thousand calories in McDonald's and yeah. Floyd Mayweather drinking a liter and a half of Pepsi Max. Oh, oh, sorry, of Sprite before he trains, just because the output is so high. Yeah, that's it. That could be hard for you to consume enough calories. Yeah, to- and um. My roommate is a a discus thrower and um, real big, strong dude. And his needs for calories is huge. So he's trying to go up in weight and he's just got to just, he eats like four plates at dinner every day and like we'll have a 3,000 calorie shake before bed and all this crazy stuff. There's no weight classes for your sport. No, No, there's not. Or like height classes. No, but um, I had a roommate my freshman year who was a wrestler um, and he had to deal with sort of the weight issues a lot and he'd have to cut weight and just not eat for a day and all that sort of thing. That would be such an eye-opener, I reckon, for like yeah, like people in Australia to see what they go through to cut weight. Like he what, wasn't drinking water. Yeah, they would sit in, Swan. you know, you can do things like, yeah, like or just go on the bike and just sweat out a lot of water weight and all that sort of thing and... Like, he's an extremely intelligent dude as well and would study a lot. And I can only imagine, like, how tough that must have been to be dehydrated, lack of food, you know, probably lack of sleep as well, and then still performing really well in the classroom. Yeah. Um, yeah, seeing stuff like that is definitely pretty humbling. These other people that you've met at Harvard, these other athletes, do you think the majority of them, their intention is to get to the top of their sport or...? Do you reckon they're just trying to use it as a way to get more affordable schooling or like what would you say the majority of their goals would be? Well, I think the thing with the fact that at Harvard it's the need-based financial aid um, so that, the you know, people can leave the sport if they want and they're still a regular student with their financial aid. Um, that means that anyone who is in their sport is there for the love of it. Yeah. For the most part, um, which I think is an amazing thing. And like there are your high performers who have every intention to go professional um but there are also like your sort of mid-range athletes who might not end up getting a a sponsorship after college and going professional and anything like that but they're they're still doing it just because they love it yeah um and if anything i find those are the the most inspirational athletes on the teams um because they're doing it for the most pure reason 100% do you love your sport yeah absolutely Um, there's that element of me as well who definitely wants to like you know go pro and like do really well with it Um, but yeah like could could you um, do you do any visualisation all the time yeah so like if if I'm sort of in the middle of a season and like everything about the jumps is like your run up is so crucial and you have to have the exact um, same timing every time um, and so you're running over like say 40 meters yeah up to the board where you take off and you've pretty much got to be within a couple of centimeters of that takeoff every time and that requires just so much sort of rhythm and consistency mentally to actually do that um so there'll be times you know i'll just be like laying in bed and sort of like running through the motion of the run up and like um 
kind of strengthening that rhythm in my mind. Do you make mistakes still? Yeah, yeah, no question about it. Like there, there are things that I've been making mistakes on since high school, and I still do. It's just a matter of minimizing them. Um, so in something like triple jump, there's you look at the best jumps in the world, even world records, and there are things that can be picked out of them, like that could have been done better. Um, there's never, you know, this is what some of my coaches have told me. Like there's never been a perfect jump, and there probably never will be. Um, it's just a matter of minimizing those margins of error as much as possible when you um would you call it a start line when you walk up to the start line and you've got that 40 meters in front of you yeah like what's going through your head right then you really need to think about as little as possible um i find if i think about too many cues like um i need to be upright i need to have my hips rotated this way i need my you know like you're thinking about all of these technical things at once, it'll just overwhelm you and you'll start to rush things and it'll all just fall apart. You need to be at a point where you can just say, I've done the training, my body knows what to do, I just need to be relaxed and maintain this rhythm. Are your nerves high though? Yes. Um, But like there's a way that I find you can channel that into just excitement and like energy. Yes. Um, So a lot of times what people will do in athletics is, especially in the field events, is um, if you've got a bit of a crowd drawn, if it's a championship or something like that, you sort of get a bit of a clap going and sort of you get the crowd on your side and that helps like set the rhythm. Yeah. And that really just brings up the energy in the whole environment and just gets you really excited to just get down the runway the weirdest thing happens to me man whenever I'm doing something in the gym like I'm not a pro athlete like you but whenever I'm doing something that I know is going to be very very challenging before I even start the lift I feel my heart rate start to increase Mm. and like and now I've just told myself that's my body's natural pre-workout it's getting ready to pump more blood around my body faster Mm. that's not anxiety that's your body getting ready to perform and I reckon that's helped me. To, I used to get anxious before I was going to do something really hard. But now that I think about it like that, it's completely changed it. Yeah. Like now I think, awesome, let's go. Absolutely. And like you're talking about visualization before. Um, and when I'm doing that in bed, I'll sit there and I'll like, you know, or imagine like a start line of 100 meter and I'll feel my heart rate go like really rise up real quick. But um, then I'm literally just laying in bed, just visualizing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's been really effective to kind of get used to that feeling yes. and reduce the um, the stress of being in that situation and more just actually thrive in it. Have you made jumps before where you felt like you've been in a flow state? Like yeah. Just everything's gone perfect and like you just feel like your body's doing the movements automatically. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, yeah, like I said, you need to just... To really perform at your best, you need to be able to stop thinking about a lot of things and just let your body do what the training has taught it to do. Yes. And things will just happen. Um, so, yeah, I find it's when I am thinking too much about what I need to do um, that everything becomes more tense mm. and just falls apart. Yeah. Can you speak on what it's like at Harvard? Was it what you expected it to be? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, like I go into a place like that expecting things to be very, very proper, very strict, very uptight, those kind of things, like what you would imagine of a place like that. Um, but I found that everyone is remarkably casual, like e- even from the professors and faculty to like other students and um, everything like that. Um, just... Like, I didn't expect to find that people were very humble, but they are. Like, um, not not everyone. Like, you get certain characters no matter where you go. But I found the overwhelming majority, um, despite being extremely talented in one thing or the other, are very humble about it. Um, And, yeah, like, I I think the the biggest benefit I've had from going there is just sort of learning from these other characters that I've met there and sort of seeing 
how they go about their life and sort of drawing lessons from it. Yeah. Can you elaborate on any of those lessons? Yeah, like just just the way people um, sort of conduct themselves and their philosophy and outlook on life and that sort of thing. Like, um, like I recall, there's there's a friend of mine there that um, was very Christian, for example, and I'm not personally a religious person um, at all, but. I just found it extremely interesting to have deep conversation with him about his beliefs and how he feels it impacts his life and sort of getting his perspective on things. Um, so I think just learning those, you know, those sort of different life experiences and perspectives is so valuable. Yeah. When I've had conversations with religious people, what it reiterates to me is how important it is to believe in, in something do you know what I mean yeah. like these people the way that they conduct their conversations and the things they believe give their life a lot of purpose and although I'm not religious like I can still have my have my life play out in a certain way and believe it's going to be this thing that I want it to be mm. which I think is awesome um, what are you what are you actually studying at Harvard like yeah so my major is history of science and then my minor is earth and planetary sciences which leads to? Um, so the, the first one, history of science, is very broad in nature. Um, so that could lead to, you know, just work in academics or writing for scientific journals or anything like that. And, but it could really translate to whatever career you might want. It's um, like a degree at Harvard is classed as a liberal arts degree, which is um, designed to be sort of broad in nature like so you're getting skills in humanities like social sciences arts science engineering like everything like that yeah um and history of science is definitely one of those majors that really expands on that i feel and so we'll look at an issue of science like you'll look at climate change for example um and beyond the the actual hard science being done we'll look at well what affects it politically what's the you know, what are the cultural and social influences on this issue? Um, what are the economic barriers to it? Those sorts of things. Yeah. So it's a more holistic view on sort of scientific topics. What, what job do you want to get out of that if you take that path? Yeah, so that's something that I'm still definitely trying to figure out. Um, like, it's something that's constantly evolving for me and, like, I, I'm coming to terms with that, like, that I don't know where my life is going to go and that's okay yeah um as long as i feel that i'm sort of pursuing meaningful things um and always continuing to learn yeah yeah we've talked a lot about your sports and going to harvard which is why i wanted to get you on but you also do some photography yeah do you want to speak on that for sure yeah so i've been doing um photography for probably about six or seven years now and then I've started doing some videography as well just like the last six months or so um, and now that I've been back I've been sort of trying to make that a bit more of a business and starting to do more commercial work with it um, so like I've gone in as an assistant videographer for two weddings over the last few weeks and um, just doing other little video projects um, for little businesses in town and that sort of thing but um when it comes to doing photography in my own time i would love to go like out on a hike and do some landscape photos or um get a drone up and do some like coastal photography like yeah yeah your stuff's great i would encourage people to go look at it where can they find it um on instagram it's just called murph's media um same as on facebook and then the website is murphsmedia.net do you think uh living this life as an athlete has given you skills that will help you run your own business if you decided to go down that track absolutely like um sort of what i hear about the the student athletes that have graduated from colleges is that they tend to have developed extremely good time management skills and um know how to manage their personal lives very well yeah um so i think that's something that will translate to every other area of life absolutely 
once your time's up in at Harvard in two years, you'll definitely come back to Shepparton or Australia or will you stay in America? That's still open-ended. Um, I can definitely see myself spending a few extra years, whether it be with schooling or working abroad. Um, but I can also see myself coming back to Australia at some point. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I could see myself living somewhere coastal. Um, I really like the idea of Geelong, for example. Why? Do you like the water? I do. People yeah. are just, some people are just drawn to it. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't know, just as like a, a photographer as well, um, there's so much awesome stuff you can do by the coast. Um, and like, I actually really love um, the regions. Um, but then in terms of opportunity and stuff, it's nice to be in proximity to like a major city like Melbourne, for example. So somewhere like Geelong um, is quiet enough that you can have you know, plenty of space and like feel relaxed and that sort of thing, but still be close enough to where everything's happening. Yeah. Um, because I've never been a big fan of like living right in the city. Like I could never live in an apartment complex or something in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, yeah. I reckon if I was to move anywhere that wasn't Shepparton, it would be Geelong for the yeah. same reasons. Melbourne's just too intense, too big, too much going on. But like Geelong just has everything there, doesn't it? It's the right, right size. It's got the beach. Yeah. I reckon it'd be great. All right. Uh, last question, Kyle. Who locally inspires you? I think there's a, there's a lot of people um, locally, whether it be family or friends that are really inspiring just because they sort of um, really forge their own path, you know, like whether it be um, trying to start up their own business or that sort of thing, like they really know what they want and they're just willing to kind of work for it. Um, yeah, like I have a friend, for example, that all throughout this COVID um, pandemic, you know, um, his industry of work has been completely shattered. He works in the entertainment industry and there's been zero work for that for almost a year now. Um, and he has continued to just work extremely hard. He just finds odd jobs everywhere, um, keeps himself afloat and then is now going to go start up and run a new bar in Bendigo, which has just come out of nowhere. He's an extremely spontaneous guy. Yeah. Um, but he can he can fucking work that's awesome yeah Um, so people like that I think definitely alright thank you for joining me Carl thank you beautiful man